Dear all, I'm Yuri Nikolaevsky, the director of the 2020 MC Summer School. And um, let me start with um, acknowledging the Wurundjeri and Bunarang people who are traditional custodians of this land. And we would like also to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians present. Now, let me say I'm absolutely thrilled to see such a huge and amazing turnout and such an interest to our public lecture. And because we have many people here who are not summer school <coughs> students, obviously. Let, <laughs> me, let me give you a little bit of context. So um, the summer school, MC Summer School, is the annual event, probably the largest of this sort in Australia, when students from all uh, the universities, mathematics and statistics students from all Australia, come to one come to one particular university, and then we had 160 students this year, which is almost the world record, and then. <laughs> We have 12 uh, expert lecturers, and so all these people work tirelessly and hard for the whole January. They learn, they teach, and I would say this event, um, the public lecture, just the crowning event of the whole thing. So it's amazing that we have so many people here, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to La Trobe University, who is very honored to be the host of the MC Summer School and the host of this summer lecture in 2020. And let me um, introduce Chloe Pierce, who is the manager of the higher education of the MC, uh, research and higher education of MC. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Um, on behalf of MC, I welcome you um, as the research and higher education uh, manager. Um, tonight, as Yuri said, uh, forms part of our special program uh, for the AMC Summer School. And it's actually part of a larger program that AMC conducts called Securing Australia's Mathematical Workforce. So we have $2 million <coughs> worth of funding um, over four years, um, along with our AMC member departments to fund the Summer School and a number of other research training activities that take place nationally. Uh, so as Yuri said, for the past uh, four weeks, we've had 165 students uh, studying honours, masters and PhD level mathematics and, and statistics. And everyone's come together um, to study these eight new intensive uh, su subjects uh, over January. So the MC Summer School uh, isn't all about study. Uh, we've also had a careers day, uh, movie nights, weekend excursions and special mass lectures. Uh, to encourage our next generation of mathematical scientists to network together, use their creative talent, and also think about their next uh, move career-wise. So tonight's event, uh, we hope, will uh, challenge your thinking. And uh, just um, in terms of the planning for tonight, we actually planned this lecture back in July last year. So this event has been six months in the making um, and was prior to any uh, recent environmental disaster that is uh, hit Australia. So tonight we aim to present scientific facts around climate change to challenge you to think about what is happening to planet Earth. Questions will be allowed at the end of tonight's presentation, uh, so please hold your comments till the end. Uh, we also will be filming tonight's uh, presentation, um, as you can see, and it will be available on AMC YouTube in the next two weeks. Uh, so before we get started tonight, um, I say to our students um, and also to our guests, uh, we hope tonight's lecture uh, not only inspires you uh, to decide on the next stage of your career path, um, but we also remind you that in your career, uh, new and exciting problems will arise and STEM skills uh, will be needed heavily to solve them. I'd like to introduce you uh, to the AMC director, Professor Tim Brown. Um, it's my very great pleasure tonight uh, to introduce uh, the speaker, uh, Professor David Caroli, who is currently um, the leader of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub uh, in the National Environmental Science Program, CSIRO. Uh, and his lecture title's up in front of you, so I'm not going to repeat that. 
Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, David is um, a very distinguished uh, scientist, a member of the Australian Academy of Science, has contributed um, to the uh, international work on climate change over a very, very long period. Um, and in fact, I know that to be the case because we both started uh, as lecturers at Monash University at a date that I'm not going to reveal, but it's a long time. <laughs> Uh, a long time in the past. Um, our careers have taken very uh, different trajectories, but we've both been involved um, in mathematical sciences in one way or another and other things uh, over um, the intervening, intervening period. Um, and so it's a very special pleasure that I'm able to introduce him tonight. And I'm sure you're keen now to hear him, not me. So uh, over to you, David. So I'm assuming you can hear me, is that fine? Okay, so as, as Tim said, I've had a background in maths departments for a long time, and at one stage ended up as the head of the maths department or the School of Mathematical Sciences at Monash University for two years against my better judgment because I'm not really a mathematician, and I didn't really want to be a mathematician. I wanted to use mathematics and physics to better understand things that are going or, you know, along around us. And what I do know is that everyone's got an opinion about weather and climate. And they know that if it's a good day today, you won't have to wait long before you get a bad weather day tomorrow or the next day. And that's exactly what's going to happen if you look at the weather forecast for Friday. It's going to be a stinker. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how I have used mathematics and probably physics as well to understand the behaviour of the atmosphere. Because we also know that while there are differences in opinions around climate change, what I hope I'm going to do today is help you better understand what models are, in that case mathematical models are, for understanding the climate system. They're not toys as models. I mean, that's what we learn about as model toys. They're not um, people demonstrating fashions, which are other sorts of models as well. These are mathematically based models. And what I'm going to do is essentially use this to help to understand models. And you know, what we have in terms of climate models, what they are is representations. I will try to demonstrate that they're realistic representations that we can use to simulate past and current global climate conditions. And that they're actually, if we can demonstrate they have skill in simulating the past, maybe they're useful rather than crystal balls or opinions from commentators to understand and project future climate change and then to understand how climate might vary in terms of changes in extremes. So what I'm going to do in this talk is maybe give an overview initially of climate extremes, then evaluate the causes of recent observed changes, a little bit about what has been the human role in recent climate change based on models and observational evidence. And first of all, though, I've got to recognise and acknowledge that there has been a very long history of other scientists that have been involved in understanding climate variability and climate change. And some of the material that I I'm going to talk about is based on a group of scientists that developed or have developed and are continuing to work with the latest complex mathematical model developed in CSIRO in the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. But there's also lots of people elsewhere that have worked on understanding and applying model simulations to understand how we could use these models to understand the causes of climate variability and change. Now, there's no end of cartoons that talk about climate change and climate variability. There's also no end of people with strong opinions about climate change. Now, it's important to understand that the person on the left in these cartoons is not a current Australian politician. 
And the person on the right in the cartoon is not me <laughs> because he's much younger than me. But it is true that a number of the commentators represented by the stereotypical balding, aged male on the left-hand side are male and aging and have strong opinions. And he says that, you know, global warming's a left-wing conspiracy and it's been designed to overthrow capitalism. Um, maybe, maybe not, but that's obviously an opinion. He also says that, you know, we couldn't possibly do anything because reducing carbon dioxide emissions is going to cripple the economy and would send us back to the Stone Age. Not only that, forget global warming, we're actually heading to an ice age. I don't remember the person on the right-hand side in the cartoon and I'm going to try to provide you with evidence that humans are the dominant factor contributing to the increases in global average temperature over the last 100 years. And I'm going to show you lots and lots of different ways that we can look at that evidence. And the character on the left-hand side describes the character on the right-hand side as alarmist, as if that's a criticism. Now, I would argue, and there's another parallel cartoon that I'm not showing about similar sorts of things, but now raising alarm, I would say if you can foresee a major issue for either an individual or a major issue for the whole of society, raising alarm based on science, based on evidence, is entirely appropriate. I'm not trying to raise alarm, I'm trying to raise concerns about what is known by the international scientific community to be a major issue for Australia. And all the governments around the world agreed, now in 2015 and prior to that, that climate change is a major issue. And I'm going to show you tonight some of the evidence. Some of the evidence about how models work, how the models can then be tested, and then both the observational evidence and the modelling evidence of why climate change is a major concern associated with human activity. And I'm going to use observational data to test the climate models. I'm going to talk about some theoretical analysis. But the underpinning point of this is we only have one planet to live on and we can't run controlled scientific experiments on that planet easily. You could argue that we're running an uncontrolled experiment at present by injecting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and seeing what happens, but we have no alternative yet about running that experiment over and over again and restarting it by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The climate system is a very complex system. I should say that AMS is going to make these slides available not only through the video but as a sort of PDF file. So you can take photos or pictures if you want. You don't need to because it will be made publicly available afterwards. The climate system has many, many different components. We understand that much of the climate system is determined by the amount of solar radiation or sunlight that's absorbed, not only in the atmosphere, but particularly at the surface of the Earth. And we know that the dominant factor driving the warming of the climate system is sunlight. We know that because when the Earth is more directly tilted towards the sun, as it is in the summer season, summers are hotter than winters. And when the sun's more directly overhead, it more, more sunlight is absorbed. So sunlight is critically important. We have to represent that and how it, the variations in absorbed sunlight drive temperature gradients that then drive the circulation. We also have to understand that the ocean is critically important and ocean circulation and absorbing heat and absorbing gases, moving those around, as well as the land surface and vegetation, as well as ice sheets. All of these complicated interactions are critically important in understanding not only day-to-day -day weather variability, but also in understanding longer-term variations. So, 
I'm going to briefly talk about what we need to do to represent all of those complex processes in mathematical models of the climate system. And the first thing we have to do is to recognise that the processes that are important in the climate system can be and have been represented through mathematical equations, for instance, in the movement of the atmosphere or movement of the ocean, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and then the fluid dynamical equations of motion that can be used to represent the time variations of essentially the air or the ocean as fluids, how they move. We also have to represent many of the important processes like how clouds form when the moisture in the atmosphere gets close to saturated and droplets form to make clouds. We have to also understand the absorption of both sunlight, short wavelength visible radiation, as well as infrared or heat radiation, and how they transfer as functions of wavelength and get absorbed by the surface of the Earth or by the atmosphere and its constituents, both solar and infrared radiation. In practice, the sorts of mathematical equations are essentially based on the first principles of physics that are then applied. And what we have to do is recognise that we can't just do that. Well, we actually, we can do it as a single set of equations for the whole of the Earth, but they're not going to help very much in understanding the spatial patterns or the vertical patterns of climate variations. So what we do is represent the whole of the Earth on a grid system essentially a set of grid boxes like those shown here where there's a grid over the surface of the earth and each of these grid boxes might be 100 to 200 kilometers across. They're shown in here as much coarser grid than that over North America. And then <coughs> each grid cell, the atmosphere and the ocean are represented as multiple layers in the atmosphere and multiple layers in the ocean and you end up representing the transfers from adjacent grids as well as vertically and horizontally. So those grid boxes are then used to solve the equations over time and over this grid. And what we then have to understand is that there's not just one model. We've got to represent the behaviour of the atmosphere as one model, we've got to represent the different components, the atmosphere, the ocean, the land surface, the ice components, all as separate models that are coupled together. And some of these models also have components for what are called atmospheric chemistry, which might be the chemical variations that affect ozone, or could also be the essentially changes in greenhouse gases and how the greenhouse gases are then taken up by vegetation in the land surface model or taken up into the ocean and moved around in the ocean. Now in practice I'm going to be primarily talking about a version of the model which does not currently include the atmospheric chemistry component or the carbon cycle. But those do exist in these sorts of models. I'm going to sort of skip those. And what we've then got to do is solve the equations and then couple the solutions continuously over different time steps between the different components of the model. Well, how do we do that? We have quite large sets of computer code that are set up in exactly the same way as weather forecast models are set up to predict the behaviour of the rare atmosphere, typically with a relatively short time step, depending on the representation, but typically time step of 20 minutes. And the horizontal grid that's typically represented is of the order of 100 kilometres by 100 kilometres. The nice thing is that 100 kilometres is roughly one degree, so we're talking about 360 grid boxes around the equator and 180 north-south. And you can do the arithmetic. That's a pretty big number of grid boxes. Multiplied by the 80 levels in the vertical in the atmosphere and that starts to be 
a lot of grids. And it's not one variable because we know that the state of the atmosphere is represented by three components of velocity and temperature and moisture content that we're solving for and the pressure at the surface. So you end up with this essentially 80 times 180 times 360 by essentially seven independent variables. That's a lot of partial differential equations to solve simultaneously every 20 minutes. It needs a big computer and a big data store to save the data because we're running this every 20 minutes for several hundred years. Not just once, but multiple times over. It's a lot of numbers and you need big computers. Now, ideally, we'd like to run this at much higher spatial resolutions, but it then ends up much, much bigger because if you go to a 10 kilometer horizontal grid, you've got 10 times as many grid boxes in the east-west direction and in the north-south direction, and you've still got to solve it, and you've got to have a much shorter time step. So, problem is we don't have powerful enough computers to do that repeatedly. We do have a big computer. This turns out to be a picture of the last version of the supercomputer that's available at what's called the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra. This is a photo. It was called Rigen. It's just in the process of being replaced by a new high-performance computing system called Gadi. And my understanding is Gadi is an indigenous word from one of the Aboriginal languages, but I can't remember what it stands for. It is now being re replaced and Gadi does now work, but it hasn't got all the new computer cells available. It has massive data stores. And even then, yes, it can run the weather simulation models or the weather climate simulation models, but as scientists, we always say it's not big enough. We just want more and more. So, this animation is actually what's on the screen at the moment from a high resolution, this is a higher resolution climate simulation, but just for the summer of January, what, December, January and February of 1990 within these models. And if you look at it, it actually doesn't look any different from the sorts of weather simulation, well not simulations, the weather data that you get shown on your TV with the pressure patterns on the rainfall patterns because the colours in this are the rainfall patterns, the lines are the pressure field and but I mean even just looking at that still image the sorts of features that it's showing like a tropical cyclone like cell here off the in the Coral Sea of, off uh, Queensland or the high pressure belt here. Those sorts of patterns and the rainfall distributions associated with those are very realistic. And so at this representation, this is only a sample of climate model output um, for one period of time. What I'm gonna do now is talk about the evolution of these climate models before I get on to the rather more detailed analysis. Now, it's important to understand that climate models were started to be developed in the 1960s and 1970s and initially these were rather simplified versions of the climate system. For instance, the first generation of climate models had no clouds represented in the climate model and it's clear that clouds are important the models had rain, but they didn't have clouds. Now, the rain was when the switch basically said when the humidity gets to 100%, the water falls out as rain, but it didn't have any clouds to interact with the radiation system. That's obviously simplistic. You can go through the evolution, and in practice, the sorts of models that we're talking about now are these complex, much more uh, multi-system models that not only represent circulation in the ocean, 
can represent the interactive vegetation, the emissions of aerosols, the emissions of air pollutants into the atmosphere, the interactions associated with the chemical uh, variations as well. These are, if you like, the mid-2000s, and now we have a whole range of different options in terms. And usually the biggest thing that's changed most recently is to just try to go to higher and higher spatial resolutions. Yes, the complexity has improved, but the attempt has been to try and represent different components of the climate system at higher resolution. And the reason we do that is these different climate models, and the letters here are to do with the naming of different assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And FAR is one of the things that many scientists seem to like. It's a three-letter acronym, or a TLA, for the first assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1990. The grid boxes were around 500 kilometres and somewhere hidden there is the United Kingdom. But it's not a separate set of islands. This is Greenland and it's very crudely represented. Come down to the most recent representations out of the order of 100 kilometres horizontally and you can now not only represent the United Kingdom, you can also represent the Mediterranean and the Alps and see that at that spatial resolution you can not well represent the geographical representations but you can represent much better. But the limit, as I said before, for these representations, the limit is how much power we have. That limits the length of the simulations and the horizontal resolution and the number of, if you like, runs that you can make with them. It's pretty important to also understand that as you go to higher and higher resolution, the sorts of ways that very small scale processes, like thunderstorms or clouds, like thunderstorms that led to the hail that dramatically impacted Canberra a week ago, how well that sort of a system can be represented depends enormously on the spatial resolution and you cannot represent hailstorms in grid boxes that are 100 kilometres across. They can be parameterized, inadequately represented. We really need to run much higher resolution. We also need to have very broad data sets of observations because we need to be able to evaluate the simulations. And then I also need to talk about, if you like, What's the difference between a climate model and a weather forecast model? And many of us experience the results of weather forecast models because they're used to provide the forecasts of day-to-day -day weather. And for you to plan what your activities might be, not only tomorrow but on the weekend, and make sure that in terms of risks, we're aware of extremes in weather. But the forecast skill of those weather forecasts, which are specifically predicting the state of the atmosphere days in advance, the skill is only reliable for up to about 10 days. If you're lucky, maybe more than 10 days. Now, climate models are designed not to predict the exact precise state of the atmosphere at a specific time in the future. We know that the climate system is chaotic, it's random. Small variations can lead to larger variations over time. What we're trying to do with the climate model is to predict the response to known changes. What I'm going to describe as forcing factors, and this might be changes in sea surface temperature, it might be changes in the radiation components. Like if there's a massive volcanic eruption, as there was in 1991, Mount Pinatubo, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on, there was a well-observed decline in temperature because the volcano emitted lots of dust and particles in the atmosphere. It reflected sunlight. If the sunlight's reflected, you'd expect a cooling. So these changes in forcing factors, like volcanic aerosols or changes in sunlight from the sun due to 
solar sunspot cycles or changes in greenhouse gases all can influence the climate. The climate models are used to try to understand the changes in the state of the climate, remembering that the state of the climate is the long-term average. The WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, recommends that, if you like, the state of the climate is the 30-year average. But also the combination of all the variability. It's the extremes as well as the average over a 30-year period. And because we know that the climate system is chaotic, we're not trying to predict the average state, sorry, the specific state of the atmosphere, the weather. Now it's close to the end of January. Who's got a birthday in July? In the audience? I do. So someone put their hand up over there. Yeah? Do you reckon it's going to be as hot on your birthday as it is today? <laughs> Maybe if you're inside in Melbourne. But most people would think that the typical July day is going to be a lower temperature than the 30 Celsius we had today in Melbourne. In fact, Melbourne has never had a July day of 30 degrees Celsius. So it could happen, but it's pretty unlikely. So that's just predicting the response. We've been able to do those predictions not of the precise weather on your birthday, but just the changes in the typical conditions, the climate. But let's now talk about some other aspects of the climate. Talking about temperature is easy for the climate models. Representing rainfall is much, much harder. This is the 20-year average rainfall at the upper part here from observational data over the whole globe. This one down here is combination of climate model simulations for the period of 1980 to 1999, for models that were actually started in 1900. And the only change that they had was to let the models run freely out from 1900 to the future. And they agree pretty well. If you look really, really closely, like here over Australia, the model simulations are a little bit wetter than the observations. The observations do better at representing the very dry conditions over Australia. But for most people, if I was to show you these, most people, if they, if they didn't have a label that said one was observations and one was model, would not be able to tell the difference. The models do a very good job of representing the seasonal cycle. They do a very good job of representing many other aspects of the climate system. This is... Again, another set of climate models that started in 1880 and each of the individual wiggly lines is a different climate model run by a different country around the world starting in 1800. And then what they've been done, the way to make this graph, was they adjusted all the temperatures to the observed temperature in 1900. And what you can see is they all show lots of ups and downs the chaotic nature because of the differences in the models. And what is also shown here is three separate observational data sets in the thick coloured lines, including one black line, but not this one. This thick, smooth line is the average across all the climate models. Now, something happened in 1991 and 1992 in these climate models and it was, in fact, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And those particulates injected by the aerosol were represented in each of the climate models. It turns out that some of the climate models represented the effect in 1991, and others had a longer term to represent the effect and showed a slower response in 1992. The observed temperatures did really fall in 1992 and not much in 1991. But you can see the models actually represent that effect. The others ups and downs are the sorts of natural variability, El Nino events and things like that. Now, 
That was one way to assess the models. They, I should perhaps just go back and say, well, actually, if you look at the, the longer term changes over this period from 19, 1990 to, say, 2009, there's pretty good agreement. And in particular, this was 2008, which was a La Nina event. 2009, there's very good agreement. In fact, the long-term temperatures show exactly the same sorts of average response. What about, if we want to look at some other characteristics, how well do the models represent the variability? And this is a graph that shows what's called the amplitude or the spectral density of variations in global temperatures across all of a set of climate model representations as well as the observation. And this variability is across a range of different timescales based only on data in the observations from 1901 to 2005, basically a 100-year period. And you can't represent with 100 years of data variations occurring at longer periods than about 50 years. So there's really no data in the observations outside this 50-year period variations. Many of the models are run out for longer than 100 years, but you see that this dark black line is the observations, and generally the variability in the model simulations across this range of models agrees very well. Not for the individual peaks, because there's an uncertainty in the spectral estimates. And this shows the range of uncertainty in the observations because we have only one realisation. And these shorter error bars for the variability in some of the models is because we have either longer estimates that reduce the uncertainty in the variability at 10-year timescales or other timescales, or because they have multiple realisations. And what we see is that Within these uncertainty bars, the observations and the models show no difference. There's actually good agreement. So the models represent the variability. The models seem to show the rainfall patterns. They seem to show the right sorts of longer term trends over a 20 year sample. Let's now look at a simple experiment. A simple experiment that's actually quite complicated and that is to run two different sets of simulations from 1880 right up to the present period. And the present period in these simulations was up to 2005 because the analysis was completed in 2009. And the sets of simulations we're going to compare is climate model simulations in the bottom panel here that just include all the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere and the land surface, coupling with clouds, but do not include any human influences or climate. They do include the volcanic eruptions because those are natural processes. And you can again see that here was Mount Pinatubo in 1991, and the average across Sorry, the observations show a cooling then, and the average across the climate models show the cooling as well. And you can vaguely see, but not very well, that there's a whole bunch of blue lines which are the different climate model simulations. But this is the observations. This is the model simulations with natural variability alone and natural forcing factors. Changes in sunlight from the sun, volcanoes. If I look at those two graphs, or lines, I would say it's impossible to demonstrate an agreement of the warming since 1950 with the climate model simulations that just include natural variability alone, visually. But you can also demonstrate it because the whole range of the model simulations is outside. Now remember, these models started in 1880. There were no additional inputs except the volcanic aerosols. And then we run a separate parallel set of simulations, same models, but now we include the human influences on climate, increases in greenhouse gases and other human impacts on climate associated with industrial particulates. The agreement between the mid-range is almost too good. 
The models weren't tuned to represent this, but there's certainly been criticism that this agreement between the average across all the models for the last 50 years is almost too good. But what we can conclude from this is actually the models seem to be able to agree very well with the observations and you can't explain the observed warming unless you do model simulations with increasing greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide and other long-lived greenhouse gases. So what about if we look at the same simulations, but don't look at global temperature, let's look at Australian temperature. And that's exactly the same set of simulations. We've extracted in the blue band here the decade-to-decade -decade temperature variations in the natural models. There's no blue lines wob wob wobbling up and down. This is the range of the decade-to-decade -decade temperatures. The black continuous line here is the decade-to-decade -decade observed temperatures in Australia. And the wiggly line is the observed temperature variations of Australia from the Bureau of Meteorology averaged across Australia. And you can see that actually temperature didn't change much until about the 1950s. There was lots of ups and downs, but it's only after the 1950s that the temperature started to increase. And this sort of grey band is the climate model simulations and the range of the decade to decade variations with increasing greenhouse gases. You've got to remember first of all that if we're talking about decade to decade variations, that's exactly what this black line shows, but the year to year variations in temperature can be outside that range. Because by taking the decade to decade averages, you've smoothed out a lot of the year to year variability. You get more robust estimates of climate variations when you look at decade to decade temperatures but the extremes are important. And I'm going to come back later on, talk about 2019. 2019 set a new record for the hottest average temperature in the observational record since 1910 for Australia. The previous record was back here in 2013, and that was the year of the angry summer, as it was called by the uh, climate Commission when it used to exist. I'm going to talk a little bit later on on how extreme was 2019 and look at that. But this is showing, again, for Australia, very good agreement with the model simulations and you can't explain the warming that we've observed just due to natural variability. Well, what do we expect? with the latest generation of climate models. And this is now two different climate model simulations, one with low future emissions of greenhouse gases on the left-hand side and the other one with high emissions of greenhouse gases. It's not just a model for Australia, it's a model of the whole globe and I've just grabbed the data and it's been animated. And I'll go back again, but that looks pretty hot. And what it shows is that for the high emission scenario, the global temperature goes up by about six degrees globally. And in Australia, you can tell that where most of Australia is above six degrees. Now, this panel here shows the low emission scenarios when all countries rapidly reduce their emissions based on the sort of emission scenarios that were supposed to limit global warming to well below two degrees. The only problem is that now, even though all countries essentially meet the Paris Agreement targets and all countries get to net zero emissions before 2100, global average temperature is above the two degree threshold. And there is no threshold, it's a continuum of temperatures. That's just not enough. So, now, having talked about climate models and shown historical simulations and shown future simulations, I'm now going to do a little bit of slightly more complicated mathematical analysis. It's still a relatively simple perspective, but I'm going to do 
a simple presentation of what I started to do in 1987, which was a long time ago. That's when I first published a paper that tried to assess how much of observed patterns of temperature change could be linked to increasing greenhouse gases and how much might we just due to natural variability. Because at that stage, way back in the 1970s and early 1980s, I was quite sceptical about human influences on climate and wanted to disprove that increasing greenhouse gases were having an impact on global temperatures. And I thought that I could be a, do this by a clever way as a, what I might call a criminal investigator, use fingerprints. And fingerprints are just spatial patterns. In this case of temperature change, and seek to, if you like, discriminate between the temperature changes in the vertical, in the atmosphere, due to increasing greenhouse gases, versus those due to, say, increases in sunlight from the sun. I'm also going to talk not about the vertical patterns. That's what I did in 1987. We're going to look at the spatial patterns in this analysis. But we're going to use fingerprints and discriminate between the spatial patterns due to increases in sunlight or natural variability from the spatial patterns due to increasing greenhouse gases. And this is called the detection and attribution of climate change. And often, using fingerprints can enhance the signal of climate change due to any of the causes relative to the noise of natural variability. Because what we're trying to do is identify signals in the noisy natural variability of the climate system. And what we're trying to do in this attribution is, first of all, make sure that the tools that we use, the climate models, are able to represent the internal variability well. And I've already shown that. Remember the decadal temperatures and the agreed well in the climate models with observations. We then have to make sure that the responses in the climate models agrees with the observed responses to different forcing factors, like the responses to increasing greenhouse gases in the models agrees well with observations and vice versa. And secondly, we have to be able to eliminate or show that the responses that we're seeing are not consistent with alternative physically plausible explanations. Many people come up with explanations of the observed warming. And I was asked on live radio in the Melbourne Zoo, in the insect chamber, when we were talking about observed changes in the rapid appearance or earlier appearance of butterflies around Melbourne, associated with the warming in the climate around Melbourne, whether we'd taken all the different causes into account, and I'd said, well, we'd considered increasing greenhouse gases, we'd taken into account changes in sunlight from the sun, we'd taken into account urban heat influence. And they said, well, was there anything you didn't take into account? And I said, well, we, we didn't take into account the invisible heaters from aliens. <laughs> but I think that's implausible. And they thought I was making a joke, and I wasn't. I still think that that's a perfectly realistic scientific assessment. Invisible heaters from aliens cannot be scientifically eliminated, but I still think it's implausible that they're causing the heating around Melbourne or around the globe. We could not test for that in any of the analysis that I'm going to talk about. In the, they could still be there. I still think it's very unlikely. So. Fingerprint detection. We're trying to look for fingerprints of different factors. We have to break down the responses and we use climate models with individual forcing factors to look at these spatial patterns due to changes in sunlight, changes in volcanoes, changes in greenhouse gases, changes in aerosols in the atmosphere, all the and natural variability. 
We use the models to also try to estimate uncertainties as well as uncertainties in the observational data. And we again have to show that the competing explanations are not viable. And I still think we didn't take into account aliens, but I still think it's okay not to include them. First of all, we couldn't work out what impact they were going to have. So, what do we do? Well, the first thing is we essentially have to try to break down this complex multi-dimensional space-time patterns into a manageable set of variables. And that often means representing them, as I said before, into 10 year by 10 year spatial patterns from the observations, shown here on the left hand side, and model simulations on the right hand side. And what we have in the models is individual sets of simulations or fingerprints, time varying fingerprints decade by decade, for each of the different forcing factors. And then what we're going to do is try to represent these observational variations, decade by decade, smoothed in space, in terms of a linear combination of the different fingerprints. And we're going to try to assess that in terms of what's called this scaling factor beta, and an uncertainty, which is a measure of the goodness of fit. That's just linear regression. But it's a bit more complicated than that because it's vector linear regression over large spatial fields, but it's been used at least in statistics for a large period of time. Now what we effectively are doing is then looking at this as a set of vector equations for the observations filtered into low order space time patterns and filtered over time into decadal variations. The X is the signals or fingerprints and we're using those for model simulations with different forcings as I've said and we're typically using multiple estimates of those from multiple models and multiple realizations. We assume the response is approximately linear and we have tested that over and over again. And again, what's shown on the right hand side is the set of climate model simulations with anthropogenic forcing across multiple realizations. And here, the set of simulations with natural forcings again compared to the observations. And again, you can show that this set of model simulations is a very poor agreement, even with the global temperatures, but also with the spatial patterns. So, after a lot of data analysis, you end up with some simple conclusions. Not the beta factors, the scaling, but the estimates of the global average temperature change over the period from 1951 to 2010 associated with the different forcing factors. Here's the observed change in global average temperature, taking into account the spatial patterns, and these are the different responses. If we only had increases in carbon dioxide and other long-lived greenhouse gases, you'd actually have more warming in the climate system with some uncertainty. And that's because there are other human influences on the climate system. OA is other anthropogenic forcing factors and primarily particulate emissions associated with industrial activity that provide the industrial haze over industrial areas or cities, not necessarily bushfire smoke, but like bushfire smoke that gives a haze, reflects sunlight, gives you a more uniform, but it reflects sunlight back out to space and that cools the climate system on average. And these two combined together lead to the anthropogenic signal and actually, on average, the anthropogenic signal represents very well. Down here is the natural force signal. It's not zero. It's about 0 0.02 degrees warming over the 1951 to 2010 period. 
primarily associated with an absence of volcanoes over most of the century. And the internal variability is about one to two tenths of a degree. Bottom line is the increases in human activity extremely likely dominate, cause more than half of the observed warming. And that's saying that this and its uncertainties is bigger than that. And they only come up with 95% confidence, but actually it's much more like 99% confidence. They've tried to take into account the known unknowns that Donald Rumsfeld sometimes talks about in scientific analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other important components, aspects of this problem. The first one is I've talked about and most people talk about global average temperatures because it is the simplest, most confident estimate of global climate change. We also know that land temperatures warm up and cool down faster than ocean temperatures. And in fact, in terms of the global average, the global average area of the Earth has about 60% ocean, which warms up and cools down a lot slower. In fact, about 90% of the heat added to the climate system due to human activity has gone into heating up the ocean slowly. And when we look at land temperatures, the latest conclusion from a special report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change called the Special Report on Climate Change and Land, with its second key conclusion was land surface temperatures have risen nearly twice as much as the global average temperature. It's not quite twice as much, it's only 1.7 times. But whereas we have had a global average warming now of about 1.1 degrees, this is the land temperatures. If we look at that from 1900 about here and look at that across for most of this period from say 1880 to 1930, the average is about minus 0.4. And up here, this is a Fahrenheit scale, we've got to come across to here, it's about 1.2. Means the increase has been about 1.6 degrees. Yes, land warms up faster, about 1.7, 1 and 2 thirds. So if we're talking about, remember I said, 6 degrees of global warming, what's 1 and 2 thirds of 6 degrees? It's 10. The global average land warming estimated with this latest generation of models, which show higher climate sensitivities, on average is 10 degrees of global warming. You won't hear anyone talk about that or that the Paris target is not two degrees of global warming, which it is, but actually three degrees of warming over land. Most people are not fish, most people live on land. So we should be talking about Paris target of three degrees, in my view. Now we can look at other sorts of fingerprints. One of the most common ones that I should have talked about is this vertical structure. That's what I looked at in 1987. If increases in greenhouse gases are causing the temperature change, we expect warming in the lower atmosphere. In, upper, in the upper atmosphere, we expect cooling because greenhouse gases are effective gases, contributors to loss of heat from the atmosphere. And in the upper atmosphere, that loss is very important. If sunlight increases in sunlight, the favorite cause from Andrew Bolt, is causing the warming. You'd expect warming in the lower atmosphere and increased absorption of ultraviolet radiation by the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere. In other words, you get warming in the upper atmosphere and warming in the lower atmosphere. What we see is cooling in the upper atmosphere and warming in the lower atmosphere. And there's lots of other reasons we can come about with this. Let me talk about 2019, changes in extremes. If the overall temperature is increasing, we expect increases in the, not only the mean, but increases in the extremes. And actually, although daily temperatures are not exactly normally distributed, in general, temperature variations are approximately normally distributed 
around the long-term average for that time of year. And I'm going to show some pictures of that in just a second. So if the climate is warming, we'd expect more frequent hot temperatures and less frequent cold temperatures. So let's then do some analysis that I did in 2013, that previous record hot year. We did that in the climate model simulations, and this is the natural variability. And in 2013, which was this year here, we had much higher temperatures than this case here. But the first thing we had to do is compare the observations for 1911 to 2005 for summer temperatures. No, actually, it's not summer temperatures here. It's the annual mean temperature for 2013. And what we see is that around the long-term average, there's the model simulations are the solid line, the dashed line is the observations. There's a pretty good agreement. We have a much smaller sample for the observations. Doesn't agree quite as well, but that sample is probably not enough. But there's pretty good agreement. And here is the 2013 temperatures. And here's the previous record that was set in, I think, 1985. What we can now do is look at, well, what happens to the shift in distribution? And what we did in this case was look at the red is the set of climate model simulations with increasing greenhouse gases from lots and lots of climate model simulations only for the 2006 to 2020 period. And what you see is that the temperatures in both 2013 and the previous record Agree, they lie pretty well in this sort of model simulated range of temperatures for 2006 to 2020. And here is the set of what's called pre-industrial control temperatures. And it was virtually impossible in those just natural variability simulations or the control simulations without any greenhouse gases we had one in 12,000 years of simulation without greenhouse gases that matched the temperatures that were hotter than 2005, the previous record. So it was possible, but only just. So now let's go to 1990. There's 2005, there's 2013, here's 19. So 2019, another two-tenths of a degree hotter than 2013. Yes, we set a new record of both maximum temperature and annual temperature. That maximum record is expected to occur about once every seven years in the climate model simulations. And 2013 to 2019, while it isn't seven years, is pretty close to six years which is pretty close to once every seven years in the model simulations. And there were no cases in the model simulation, none in the 12,000 years of simulations that gave temperatures as warm as 2013, and certainly none gave as warm as 2019, just associated with natural variability alone. In effect, it's impossible to get Australian average temperatures like in 2019 without increasing greenhouse gases in the climate system. And therefore, we should be taking or seeking to take into account for future projections, the increase in greenhouse gases. So I'm going to finish up. I've spent more than the allowed amount of time. But a little summary from me, a little summary from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. First of all, what I've tried to describe is these complex mathematical models based on physical and mathematical representations of the climate system can be used to represent both forced and chaotic variations of the climate system. And the models show quite good agreement with the observed variations and good agreement of the observed temperature variations over the last 100 years and it is only when we include the increases in greenhouse gases in the climate system that we're able to explain the absorbed warming of the climate system, either globally or in Australia since 1950. 
And we can also use it to explain the changes in extreme temperatures, like in 2013 or 2019, in Australia or in other parts of the world. Now, there's a very famous saying from Box that all models are wrong, but some are useful. I would argue that it is, in fact, possible to show that in some of the details of these current climate models, they're wrong. They cannot represent subgrid scale processes like thunderstorms over Canberra. But that's because they're not designed to be able to do that. However, they can represent the temperature variations over Australia well, and we can use that to make conclusions about whether all countries around the world should take into account climate variability. And now, based on this work and lots of other work by climate scientists all around the world, it is clear that the human influence on the climate is clear. The more we increase greenhouse gases, the bigger will be the risk of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts on the climate system because global warming will be greater. We know how to fix it. We just have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Australia and all the countries in the world, apart from the United States, have signed on to the Paris Agreement. That agreement, if we meet our commitments, our, I mean all countries in the world, meet our Paris commitments, will not limit global warming to below two degrees. It will only limit global warming to three or more degrees. And that will lead to three times the level of global warming we've had already. And we're getting the sorts of impacts of the most recent summer with just one degree of global warming. It will get much worse. So the choices we have are to seek to limit global warming. And some people will say, well, we should just wait. Do nothing. Unfortunately, waiting is not doing nothing. Waiting is continuing to allow the continued emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that's a choice between addressing climate change or making a decision to make the problem worse. That's a different framing than you'll hear any politician say. That's the choice we have, and that's the decision that I will leave you to ponder. This is going to be made available. Thank you, and I'm happy to try and answer questions. AI techniques, I'm assuming you're meaning what I would describe as the, the sort of ma mathematical, computational, clever techniques of extracting spatial patterns. They have been used, but the simplest way is just temporal averaging, which was used first of all, and you end up with the same sorts of uh, patterns that you get out of AI techniques. The analysis that we have, because we've got so many multiple, if you like, degrees of freedom, separation of noise and simulation of the broad scale patterns is the easiest way to get high confidence solutions. The, the more degrees of freedom we have, the more, unfortunately, difficult it is to separate the patterns from natural climate variability. So I'm not sure that I understand what you mean by interpolated or extrapolated. In some sense, we have modeled the same models that started in 1880 that were run over the historical period that had the observed changes in greenhouse gases, but they weren't interpolated. They were started as solutions of 
a large number of nonlinear partial differential equations with time steps from 1880, run up to 2005. And then there were future simulations with estimated future emissions of greenhouse gases post-2005 right up to 2100. They're not extrapolated, they're just within the range of historical observational data or into the future. So those what we normally call would be historical simulations or projected changes in the future. It's the same model, the same sorts of coupling. The only difference is rather than feeding in the observed concentrations of greenhouse gases, we feed in the projected future concentrations of greenhouse gases based on economic models and emissions and things like that. They're not different models. So in the future, the natural fact is we can project what's likely to happen with sunspots. Some people have suggested we should put in projected random volcanic eruptions, but you're absolutely right, we don't in these simulations have random projected volcanic eruptions, we only have the observed volcanic eruptions in the past, and you're absolutely right, in the future there could be short-term temperature declines or decreases, much as we've seen in the past, if there were massive volcanic eruptions. But we do have the projected increases or changes in solar irradiance projected into the future with solar sunspot cycles as well. Um, that's a really good question and it was sort of a part that I skipped over, but you're right. We typically represent the fingerprint as the multi-model best estimate from the mean of multiple realizations across different models because it gives us a more robust estimate. And then use the variability across the different models. That is really an uncertainty that we can estimate from looking at multiple realizations with single models and then come up with an uncertainty estimate for the spatial pattern, the fingerprint. And that has been taken into account in some of the more complex studies. But you're absolutely right. Often I was just talking about the average and then the uncertainty range is associated with the internal variability as well as the variability across the different models in that as well. Um, so the answer is yes, but it's even worse than that. And there's a whole bunch of what I will describe, and you're not allowed to go and tell your neighbours this, secret climate scientist business. <laughs> so you're getting into a sort of a little bit of things that isn't typically discussed in the media, but it's part of what I talked about. Remember I talked about the cooling influence of these other anthropogenic aerosols that if we go back to the graph is offsetting about half of the warming due to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere already. Now aerosols on a rainy day get washed away and it's only the continuous emissions of the aerosol that they stay in the atmosphere. So if we rapidly reduce fossil fuel burning from power stations or from diesel vehicles or petrol vehicles or things like that, the aerosols disappear really quickly. So actually, not only do you lead to a short-term warming of 1.5 degrees, that's actually the long-term stable temperature. We overshoot 1.5 degrees or more if we rapidly reduce the aerosols and rapidly reduce emissions. 
We're going to overshoot and then come down again because the long-term warming we've got from greenhouse gases in the atmosphere already is likely enough to give us two degrees of warming short term and then it, hopefully it'll cool down a little bit. So that wasn't the answer you were expecting but we've already hit enough greenhouse gases one and a half degrees and we would overshoot that if we reduced emissions rapidly over a 10 or 20 year period. That's a really good question and they take into account some of the simple feedback loops like the reflection of sunlight from snow and ice which as the climate warms the ice retreats, the snow melts and then you get more warming because more sunlight's absorbed in the ocean and into the land. However there are some feedback loops that they don't take into account like the release of methane from permafrost or the melting of methane clathrates, which are a form of ice, frozen ice under pressure that also has captured within its ice crystals some methane. There is plenty of methane clathrate deep in the oceans to lead to massive warming. So there are some feedback loops that aren't, they don't take into account in many of them the loss of the Amazon rainforest associated or the loss of Australian forests due to burning. So unfortunately there are many amplifying feedbacks that are not taken into account. It could be a lot worse. I think it was probably scary enough. That, that's a, another really good question and what we do know is that there are very large magnitude variations in temperature across quite small differences sometimes. It, you know, the difference in temperature between the top of Mount Buller and the temperature at Mansfield is typically 10 degrees or more over a distance of, I don't know, 30 kilometres or thereabouts. So spatial variations in temperature, the absolute temperature can be very large over quite small distances. You'll notice, although I didn't really talk about it, that all the graphs that you'll ever see of changes in global temperature are done as anomalies, as departures from some baseline period. Because the spatial variations of the departures from the long-term average for that period are actually much more spatially coherent. And in terms of the temperatures across Australia and their annual variations, there are only about three or four degrees of freedom in the spatial patterns of temperature variations across Australia. And across the globe, you can actually represent global average temperatures appropriately well distributed from 20 different observing sites and you can represent it very accurately as departures from the long term average because of these large, large spatial scale coherent variations. It's much more coherent for the departures of the annual average and even more coherent when you look at 10 year averages. Less coherent when you look at day-to-day -day temperature variations because you know when it's hot in Melbourne it's often colder in Perth and you can see the cold front coming across but for annual or decade averages very large spatial scales of coherence. So I can comment, not much work has been done on bushfires uh, 
but I'll draw some conclusions based on the sorts of things that I've talked about. The first one is that the specific heat generated by the fires themselves is relatively small globally as an additional heat input to warming up the surface temperature of the Earth. There's also another relatively small input, which is the centre of the Earth is actually very hot and the heat flux from below the surface is also a relatively small input, another factor. So the fires aren't warming up the global climate because we've had more fires. In fact, in Australia, we're likely to get colder temperatures next year just because it was so hot due to natural variability. The other factor then is, well, what about the smoke? Well, the smoke is likely to have an impact in the regions where there were particulates, uh, soot particles and things like that. The soot particles do two things. The soot actually absorbs sunlight and it will warm, I mean, black particles absorb sunlight. It'll warm up the atmosphere, but it won't warm up the surface because it's blocking some of the sunlight reaching the surface. So you end up locally, slightly cooler surface, and slightly warmer atmosphere. The biggest impact longer term is the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from the burning of the timber, which releases carbon dioxide. Best estimates so far is that the fires from about, well, they started in September in Queensland and northern New South Wales until the sort of December and early January fires, that emission total amount is about 400 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from those fires, which is about two-thirds of the annual total human-related emissions from Australia. Now, the bushfire emissions doesn't get counted in Australia's emissions because burning fires in forests is considered a natural emission because the forests hopefully will regrow over the next 100 years. That's why it's not counted in the Australia's anthropogenic contribution, but it's a large number and it will be measurable in terms of emissions. You know, Australian emissions are about 1.2%, so it's about 1% of the global emissions. Now that won't give a big bulge, but it will change the concentrations over Australia for a period of time and it can be measured. The single most. Uh, look, there, there are a number of different things. I mean, thinking about what we do and how we contribute individually through our actions to greenhouse gas emissions is really important. And a number of those sorts of things you can make actions on and save money longer term. Not just changing your light bulbs, but changing your light bulbs and changing your electrical appliances and putting solar panels on your roof and getting a more fuel efficient car and more fuel efficient appliances. They all have an impact. You have to decide whether your voting choice can also have an impact I'm not allowed to advise you on that. That's, that's a very good uh, place to, uh, to finish. Uh.